we have with us today professor tejas murthy an eminent scientist from indians of science for today's third lecture and he is going to talk about the art and science of nest building a hearty welcome to you sir he is a professor of civil engineering at the indian institute of science bangalore he works in the area of granular materials especially using x-ray computed tomography he works on the mechanics of cohesive granular materials he is also interested in understanding animal build structures such as termite mounds and spider webs now that seems uh, uh, a widely different uh, area of research one dealing with the biological system and the other uh, very inanimate uh, uh, granular materials but then he is going to tell us how these granular materials that he uh, works on primarily play a very important role in uh, uh, termite mounds and the structures that come about and how beautifully these are designed and he will also be talking about spider webs so professor tejas got his phd in 2007 from purdue university us and followed it up with uh, post doctoral stints at the center for materials processing and tribology and center for offshore foundation systems i quote him i am a pakka bangalorean with a fondness for long distance running and uh, without much ado i request a professor tejas murthy to give this talk which is excellently titled the art and science of nest building uh thank you very much for the people from bangalore planetarium for calling me for this um i'll start with uh, the whole idea of what are animal built structures i'm going to motivate this problem with uh, not the problem but to motivate the topic with uh, what do i mean by animal built structures and i'll try to pose these three questions uh, how do animals build these structures and uh, what do they use in building these structures and lastly why do they remain stable so these are three uh, important questions that i'll pose through the uh, talk and then i'll take the examples of bullfinch nests spider webs and termite mounds to uh, sort sort of exemplify my talk uh, throughout uh, today uh, unless i otherwise mentioned photos are usually from me or my group or uh, my collaborators Uh, and pictures extracted otherwise are uh, acknowledged in the end so whenever we talk about human construction uh, i mean human construction essentially defines civilizations so whenever we think about the egyptian civilization we automatically think about pyramids and when we think about uh, the time of the moguls we think about taj mahal and uh, so every structure every iconic structure has defined us has defined a civilization so of course i don't need to actually talk more about human construction because it sort of tells us and it it becomes icons of cities states and countries whenever we think of bangalore bangalore is represented by vidhan sauda so i, I mean i i can go on and on about how important human construction is and what i mean by um, uh, by this of course all of human construction has a very specific purpose and they are all supposed to be aesthetic at least to some extent uh, and they are all supposed to be safe and they are all optimal in the sense they are built with economy in mind so at least that's how engineering thinks about all structures you think about aesthetics safe safety as well as optimality in terms of material um, usage time etc so i i i will not talk a lot more about what do i mean by optimal but of course you want the building to be completed as fast as possible and you want it to be as cheap as possible so obviously these these play a important role in the way we think about uh, structures especially in human civilization of course this is a standard picture that you have all seen somehow we we love to identify ourselves with very tall structures so i have never seen a comparative structure of how large buildings are but somehow how tall they are seem to capture everybody's imagination so in terms of animal built structures they have pretty much this pretty much similar uh, objectives so they they need to provide shelter they need to protect the 
uh, organism from predators and they also sometimes need to help in catching the prey and of course things like mate attraction that's also a very important aspect of uh, animal build structures and things like thermoregulation i'll talk very briefly about thermoregulation it might not be on the top of our minds but it's very important whenever we talk about termite mounts so this is something that i'll definitely introduce through my talk so in my talk i will follow this very pattern i'll talk about animal build structures into three categories one i'll talk about what are called as exogenous materials or structures built from exogenous materials structures built from endogenous materials and structures that are a combination of the two okay what are exogenous materials materials that are taken from outside so a uh, classic example a bird nest this is that what i'm going to use so birds collect twigs uh, leaves etc and put together a nest and these are from exogenous materials endogenous materials are some secretions within the body of the animal so spider webs spiders secrete the silk themselves and then they build the web and then they live in that web and they use it for prey capture and they use it for all sorts of things and then a combination of this is to use external materials plus include their own secretions to build something uh, complex so and th those are classic examples such as termite mounds so i will go exactly in this order i'll talk about bird nests then spider webs and then a combination of the two which are termite mounds through the talk okay okay uh it's a little bit wordy and a little bit busy this slide but uh i just want to talk about quickly about what do i mean by process and how i have thought about this in uh, in these three classes of uh, nest systems so when i talk about exogenous materials the process is mostly behavioral uh, perhaps the ecologists will have uh, a much nicer way of presenting this but uh, i'm not an ecologist so i will with that caveat Uh, i'll just say that uh, when you're collecting materials from outside like twigs birds uh, like the 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 way birds do it's mostly a behavioral aspect okay uh, and secondly i'll talk about uh, endogenous materials which are mostly physiological the process is mostly physiological and then of course the combination of the two it's a com it's again bo both behavioral as well as physiological and uh, the material selection for construction of these nests or construction of these mounds is uh ha has all the exact same features that you would find in human construction too so the availability the properties material properties and what is the required strength and how durable it is i mean how long does uh, will this last etc etc and of course uh the one thing a little bit of engineering that uh, i will include here i have been told not to include equations because this is supposed to be a popular science talk so no equations you can be uh quite happy uh, i i'll just say that the the type of load bearing is a compressive structure versus a tensile structure or in the case of uh, in the case of these uh, combination or hybrid uh, structures like termite mounds they are mostly compression so sp spider webs are mostly tensile structures so they are all held together in tension uh, so i mean if i have to give you an example if i pull this apart i'm subjecting it to tension if i'm pushing this closer or i'm compressing it Uh, pushing this closer to one another i'm subjecting it to compression of course next so in the classic example of exogenous materials i'll i'll uh, i don't have to show you bird nests because they have they're absolutely fascinating you can just see thousands and thousands of pictures of bird nests on the net if you uh, go there Uh, again i have picked something that i thought was quite interesting but in my talk however i won't talk about the speciality bird nests so of course there are some bird nests that are very interesting like uh, the eagle nests these are uh, apparently they use very large twigs and they use the idea of loading them in gravity and making them very very stable over long periods of time or the swift nests that are that use their own secretion and create these swift nests and of course the weaver birds that actually have a behavioral pattern in which they weave very intricate uh, nests and uh, uh, you know have a build really beautiful nests so clearly these are very speciality nests and i'm not going to talk about it but most of the other nests that you look at are they look like they are a bunch of sticks that are thrown together 
So the so what I'm going to introduce here is a strategy for construction that that you can think about in terms of granular media, which is what I work on. So if I have to give you a very quick introduction to what is a granular material, so granular materials are those that are that have both properties of solids as well as fluids. So if you take a like a box of sand, you can pour sand from one container to another, but you can also stand on sand, right? So you, you have properties of both fluids as well as solids. So if you think about changing the shape of this granular system, that is if you go from predominantly what are uh, what you think about in your mind when you think about granular materials are sands and powders and things like that, so that have mostly a spherical or some shape that is recognizable uh, like this, slightly complex shapes maybe, but mostly spheres and disks, right? But let's try to move towards uh, structures or move towards grains or particles that look like sticks, okay? Flexible sticks. So if let's say you start, if, if, if you take a bunch of spherical disks and sort of pour them uh, on this table, you know that you form a heap. I mean, you have seen that. So whenever you see so much construction going on in and around Bangalore, you see trucks dumping sand, and they always form a heap, right? But let's imagine that if you have a bunch of uh, rods sitting in the truck and try to dump them uh, on the floor, what you will see is like a completely scattered configuration of this, uh, which doesn't even remotely resemble a pile or remotely resemble this uh, sort of a heap that you would see under normal circumstances. So what is this very interesting property that as you're changing the shape of the system, you move away, you move so much away from what would normally resemble a heap to something that resembles uh, like a chaotic, almost a, a very strange chaotic bundle thrown together. So uh, this, is, this is the whole idea that I'm going to present here where you can think about these bird nests as a bunch of sticks that are thrown together to form a structure that remains by and large stable. Uh, I know it might seem completely counterintuitive right now, but uh, I present here the, the various shapes that have been examined. It's a fairly recent uh, piece of work, that really fascinating piece of work, where they examined a bunch of shapes as they move away from spheres and disks into something that looks like uh, twigs from a tree, you will begin to form a, a nest-like structure as you are throwing these things on top of one another and sort of stomping on, on top of them. So case in point is when I show you this sort of a simulation. Okay? So take, take a bunch of these twigs, sort of confine them. I mean, the experiment was very simple. You try to confine them and step on them like you would like a bird would probably do, and what you end up getting is a structure that looks like a bird nest. Okay? So, or the other thing that I would like to show you is if instead of taking uh, sand and pouring them, or steel beads and pouring them, you make the beads to resemble something that looks like a stapler pin. Okay? You separate out e e each, each of these individual stapler pins and try to pour, pour them on top of the table, what you will end up forming is a columnar structure rather than a heap. If you don't believe me, you can try it at home. Okay? But I'll show you some simulations that, uh, that are uh, showing formation of these chains. So instead of taking single particles or single beads, what I will do is to form, I mean, is to sort of join them in the form of a chain. Okay? So if let's say you have lots of jewelry and lots of chains that you that you have at home and try to put all of them together in one in one box and try to pull them out or try to pour them out you will see that you will form an extremely entangled structure and that is precisely the idea that i'm trying to show here using these bunch of sticks as this configuration okay so you try to stomp on them you take a bunch of sticks put them in whatever configuration you want and try to stomp on them and you'll form a structure that almost resembles a bird nest. Okay? And I'll also show you this one. So as I was telling you, if let's say instead of taking individual beads, 
when I pull this cylinder up, either you pour it directly from a glass or pull it from inside a cylinder. Okay, fill it up and pull it inside a cylinder. All I'm doing here was individual beads. Next, beads of slightly longer dimension. That is, uh, take 24 of these beads, make a chain. Take 48 of those beads and make a chain. But as you go longer and longer, you form a more and more entangled but a very stable structure. Okay, this is the same idea that bird nests also, I mean, birds use for building their nests. So the, again, I'm not talking about very specific, beautiful examples of weaver birds weaving intricate nests. That's, that's a whole different thing. But I'm talking mostly about bullfinches and other normal birds, like pigeons and crows and whatever else, that actually throw twigs on top of one another and eventually use that emergent property to build a bird nest. Okay? Go to the last one. Okay. Uh, what I, okay, let's start with the first case. I'll, I'll just repeat this movie. Let's start with the first case where I have purely individual beads, like just regular beads. And then I, you, I use about 24 of them and make small chains about this long. But in this case, these are about 48 beads long. So I take 48 of those beads and make a chain that is about yay long and then stack all of them inside this cylinder and then pull the cylinder up. So on one hand, the moment you have pure beads, you have exactly the repose. This is what you have seen when construction lorries dump out sand, stones, etc. This is the sort of heap that you will form. But on the other hand, whenever you have some sort of a, a, an entanglement, you will end up forming a very stable columnar structure. And this is exactly what I'm saying when you, when let's say you start taking and putting something that looks like a stapler pin on top of one another, you will form a very entangled uh, sort of a stable columnar structure. So this whole idea has been recently been looked at for uh, low carbon footprint housing and things like that, where, and these are called aleatory structures, and these are disordered, completely disordered by the way, so there is no regular pattern or patterned arrangement that you would expect in like a typical brick building, right? See, they're completely disordered. And you can think about them as a situation that is in between a pure sand-like substance or something that resembles a cloth in which you have a very regular grid-like arrangement of fibers that are entangled with one another, right? You, you entangle them in a very specific orderly fashion for a piece of cloth, whereas in a sand, you just heap them. So let's think about these structures as something in between the two, and you end up thinking about what you can uh, envision as a bird nest. Okay, and then of course, uh, with I, I don't know if uh, if you're following any research these days, you know that metamaterials are a huge thing. So I just put that in there that these are lightweight metamaterials. So this is perhaps the first part of my talk where I this is about bird nests. These are purely exogenous systems. Okay. Now let's move towards endogenous systems, which are uh, the, the the case that I'll be using are silk uh, the um, silk making uh, spider webs. Okay, so if you look at the specific example I'll use, our, what are called a stegodiphus, and these are social spiders. So spiders are usually solitary; they live alone, they live in, on your walls and on your ceilings, etc. But there are classes of spiders which live together. They form nests and they weave these very intricate pattern nests that are, again, very interesting. And we are going to take a look at a little bit about what is the overall morphology of such nests, what can we understand from them, etc. Okay. The one thing that uh, I use, one of the tools that I use is image analysis. So I take photo photographs of this web and then I try to do some a little bit of uh, playing around with the images and then I can end up getting the actual structure of the web. So I can take these structures, put them into some, uh, you know, try to use them for doing reasonably elaborate stability calculations that I do in normal engineering recourse. So like, like you would think about this as a typical building. So if you have a typical building, you have what are called as beams, columns, and stuff like that. So you think about how are loads distributed in these beams and columns. That's exactly what a civil engineer would do. And that's pretty much what I do here too. So I I take images of the spider web and then I start looking at how are loads distributed through this 
uh, entire spider web structure. Uh, again, uh, not going to get too much into this, and this picture is quite bad, but uh, what, you, what I wanted to show you here is the spider web uh, of this uh, stegodyphus, of this uh, social spider that has built over some 25-day period or a 10-day period or some such thing. So if you actually think about how they build in time, so I can actually, uh, we did this experiment where uh, my ecology friends, they took one spider, five, 10 and 25, put them on a, on a, like a frame, and then decided to let them build for one day, three days, five days, and seven days, we started imaging, okay? So you will see that exactly like the way a human construction progresses, the first day you put the foundation, the second day you build the uh, whatever, second floor, I mean the ground floor and then the first floor, so whatever, unless you're doing Bangalore Metro, which will take years and years and years, but uh, you'll, you'll go from day one to day seven and you'll see that it is propagating and it's evolving in time, as well as this frame that we are looking at is, is also getting filled up, All right? So, so on day one, if you look at this particular thing, this is one spider on day one, hardly has built anything, whereas 25 spiders on day seven have pretty much completely filled the frame with their, with their web, okay? So this is the kind of thing that uh, we studied in, um, uh, in our experiments. And then when you actually try to uh, sort of do a little bit of analysis and you see that if you just count the total length of the silk that they have actually put on top of the frame, you will see that with progression in days, you'll see that the amount of silk that they have invested or the amount of silk that they have spun and put on there significantly increases to about 100 meters in terms of total length of silk, okay? So about 25 spiders can put out about 100 meters of silk in that particular, uh, a small frame, okay? It's a 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter frame. So this is what our frame looks like, and I'm going to show you a movie of the kind of things that you can actually capture. So this, as I told you, the spider web is not only their shelter, that is, they, they live here, but it's also a frame on which they capture their prey. So what you see here is a grasshopper. The grasshopper is went and fell on that particular web, and the, of course it's wriggling, trying to get out of there, and of course the silk is sticky. Let's not talk about the properties of silk and all that stuff, but the moment there is some vibration that the spiders begin to feel, they all begin to move towards this grasshopper and essentially, uh, you know, eat the grasshopper. So, uh, the other thing that I want to point out here is not only is this, this web a shelter, a place for them to live, but it's also the only place where they can actually capture their food. So, everything in their life happens on this web pretty much everything in their life happens on this particular web, okay? So, we are tr so you should think about the web not only as just a place where they are uh, living and residing, but also as a, as a frame in which prey capture happens, okay? As a, as a, like a house in which prey capture happens. And uh, so if you think about it, this is sort of an extension of the organism itself and, uh, I mean, without the web, they, they wouldn't have any prey. Right? And uh, the other point that I want to make here is the vibrations that happen on the web are the root cause for them to actually sense anything and then they move towards that. Okay? I mean, there might be other sensory cues like uh, them seeing it or smelling or whatever. We, I'm not, I, I don't know about that actually. But the studies that we work on are purely to do with how do vibrations propagate through the web. Okay? Like, like, uh, can think about vibrations propagating through a building either. The other thing for this, uh, my uh, colleague, she designed a very clever experiment in which, obviously we're not gonna put a grasshopper in here and try to see how they move. So instead to do the experiment a little bit more scientifically, she actually took a probe and then applied controlled vibration to small regions in the web, okay, and see do they actually sense this and start moving towards that? So uh, it might not be very clear to you, you, because you can't see that toothpick 
sort of vibrating. It's uh, going at quite a high frequency, and our images are not at that kind of frequency. But it is vibrating, and they sense that there is a vibration there at this particular location. So they all they all start moving towards that. Okay, the spiders, all of them, move towards that. So as I said, this web not only acts as their house, it needs to remain stable, but it also acts as a surface on which vibrations propagate and help them in prey capture. Okay. Again, there's a lot of work that's been done on the stickiness of it and on the mechanical properties and all that, but that's not, uh, not something that I'd want to talk about at this point. But just to show you, as we progress through these three very different animal built structures, starting from bird nests, two spider webs, two termite mounds. I'm trying to sort of unify what are the important aspects or characteristics that you will see across these three uh, systems uh, that I have chosen to speak about today. Okay, the last part is to do with what is called as a hybrid construction. So that is using the external materials and using the internal secretions as I was talking about. So spider silks, uh, I should remind you, is purely internally secreted. Okay. The last part are these hybrid constructions. So if you think about it, uh, so I mean, th there are these statements that you can think of. One, so if you have very large amount of internal secretions, you can sort of compensate it with smaller amount of external materials that you can use, or the other way around. Okay. So, and the important thing is the trade-off is the energy spent in searching for the correct type of material versus the energy spent in secreting the type of material that is used for binding. So, there are very good examples of such hybrid construction. Uh, Potter wasps and caddisfly larvas, larvae are uh, some other classic examples of this. Okay. So, one other, uh, another important thing is that, uh, again, this I already introduced a little bit. So, tensile structures versus, versus compression structures. They work best when pulled apart and they work best when loaded under compression. So uh, spider webs are tensile structures and pot of wasp nests or termite mound nests are all compressive structures. So that's uh, one other uh, thing that I'd like to highlight. Okay. The same process that you will see even in the endogenous, uh, I'm sorry, hybrid system. You, ha you need to choose material, you need to figure out how to transport it, how to bind it, how to put it together, that's the second part. And of course the output is the nest. Okay? So uh, the, these potter wasps, they search, like exactly like termite mounts, they search for the correct type of soil, they bring it to the specific location in which they want to build the nest and eventually end up building the nest. And then what they use the nest for, it might be for laying eggs, uh, you know, shelter, predatory, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Whatever, whatever let that usage be, that's not that much of a concern. Okay, why termite mounts? So because they are obviously very, very fascinating. You, uh, if you have seen them, you know why they seem quite fascinating. Um, so these are very tall. I have chosen the examples of, they, they come in wide varieties of shapes and sizes, by the way. So and these are, uh, I have chosen what are called as cathedral mounts. They look like cathedrals, uh, tall and uh, sort of a conical or a frustum of a cone, one of those shapes. And the important thing about this, this is that the termite mounts are the place where the termites stay. They live there, but they also grow their own food they grow a type of a fungi inside those mounds. So they, they need to create an environment which is extremely humid and which has very high temperature for growth of those fungi inside that particular mound. Okay? So whatever they do, whatever strategies that they use is uh, tuned to such a way so as to retain heat and high humidity inside that particular mound. Okay? That's the st that is the whole purpose of the mound, so to speak. And so if, uh, if you were to think about it, so you can relate that to a building in which you want to maintain temperature constant over long periods of time and also with minimal usage of energy, that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, optimization. So again, what, why and how? 
So in this, we conduct similar type of, like the way we thought about bird nests, we will also think about trying to do tabletop experiments for understanding how these materials are brought together, how does the structure emerge. So that the, the same pattern of asking this, the same question and doing the same type of experiments but on different model systems is, uh, uh, is the sort of the unifying theme here. So just to give you a perspective, these are termites are a few millimeter and the mounds can be as high as one to two meter. So if you think about a human being, about 1.5 meter tall, you need to think about a building that's about one kilometer tall for a sort of a comparison in terms of length scales to a termite body size versus a termite mound versus a, a human body size versus a, a typical or a fascinating human construction that can be equivalent to a termite mark. So the termites, they collect soil and then they use their own secretion and the available moisture and they make what are called as boluses. You can think about them like bricks, bricks in our human construction. And then they build these mounts, these tall cathedral mounts. So they use these boluses, they sort of bind them, cohere them and then they build these mounts. Okay? So uh, this, as I told you, the whole building of the web is sort of, uh, it's physiological, it's, it's sort of inbuilt into the uh, spider. As they move along, they keep playing silk. However, in terms of birds, they actually search for the appropriate type of material, bring it, and it's, a, it's a more a behavioral thing rather than a physiological thing. So here it's a combination of the two, as I, uh, as I was making that point earlier. So the, the termites, they have many castes, the major worker, minor worker, etc. So each of these have that sort of inbuilt into them. They go and collect boluses, they go and collect soil, make these brick-like structures and go and deposit them and make a termite mound. Okay? So um, this is what they look like. The, the termites that we studied are on autonomous obesis. And these are uh, boluses made, made by major workers. These are boluses made by minor workers. Obviously, the larger sized boluses are done by the major workers. The smaller ones are done by the minor workers. And so they put them together to create that mound. Okay, we'll ask the question, how do they put them together? And another thing that I want to point out is, uh, again, I want to make the point that this is somewhat inbuilt into them. Okay, the moment they see a type of material, they gather it and try to build something with it. Okay, so the experiment that we did was we gave them a range of materials, all sorts of stuff, glass beads, stainless steel pieces, uh, burnt soil, sand, red soil, brass, uh, whatever else, paraffin wax, copper, uh, zinc pieces, iron filings, all sorts of things. We, we just gave it to the termites and we tried to figure out what are they going to do with it. But, but they do end up making these brick-like structures and they try to build with whatever is available. So that's sort of inbuilt into them. So that was the, that was the whole uh, point of this experiment. But they do have a preference. They do choose soils over anything else. They do choose granular materials over anything else. So this is the way in which they choose the material system. So they choose a granular, hydrophilic, osmotically inactive, non-hygroscopic, again, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if these are extremely jargony, but all I want to point out is they choose materials that are mostly granular, mostly particulate that, that can be brought together and that can be made into sort of brick-like structures so that that can be used again to build their mound. So this three-stage construction always exists in, uh, even in the case of bird nests also. So they bring the material, they sort of put them randomly into that thing and use that whole idea of entanglement of flexible structures and build the nest. Same thing even here. So they build it, they use their secretion, build a brick and take all these bricks and uh, build the entire mound in, uh, in time. Okay? So here is a movie of these termites trying to pull out glass beads. So we took a, a dish and filled it up with glass beads and then left a bunch of termites on top of that and figured out what's, what's going to happen. So they really, really struggle and then they pull out one bead after another and then try to use their secretion to bind these beads exactly like the way, uh, like the way they, they would do with soils. Okay? 
So this, this is sort of inbuilt into them. But the other thing that we, you can look at in the, in the real mounts is when you actually make an intentional breach. Go to a mound and try to make a breach and then film it as they're making this particular, uh, as they're patching this up. So they really patch up very, very quickly. So over time, so in about 11 minutes, if you make a breach, meaning if you make a hole, right, you just stick some drill and make a hole in them and observe what they're going to do. Okay, what are the termites going to do? Let me play that movie again for you. Okay. So I, I made a hole, an intentional hole, and then I was watching how they are going to patch this up. So the termites, as we saw earlier in the couple of slides before, the major workers, minor workers, we can't really identify, but they come and start putting the putting their pieces of brick and then they cap it up. Okay, they they repair it. They repair the breach. Okay, in about 16 minutes. Okay. And now, now when you actually figure out what the what each of these boluses are, that is what each of those bricks are and correspond them to the specific sizes, right? As uh, let me go back to that particular slide and remind you of something. Okay, here, the major workers slightly bigger, the minor workers slightly smaller. Okay, so think about it this way. They, each of these major workers or the big, big bricks are being placed here and the smaller bricks are also being placed here. Okay, so if you were to, if you were to imagine how best to pack something, right? let's assume that you're packing something in a suitcase, right? So you have, you roll up all the jeans, you stack them inside your suitcase, and then you have smaller pieces of cloth, or a small towel, uh, uh, you know, some handkerchiefs and all that. You roll them and then stack it in between the, in between these large, uh, you know, jeans that you have folded up into your suitcase. So essentially, you can take these many clothes and pack them very efficiently in a really tiny suitcase. And the whole idea is, if you have uh, materials that have one unitary dimension, that is one specific dimension, they don't pack as efficiently as if you have a range of sizes. So the, the wider range of sizes you have, the more efficiently you can pack something into, a, into this system. And that's the same idea that you can see here. The major workers have these large bricks, the minor workers have these very tiny bricks, reasonably tiny. So they go and place them in such a way, I'm not sure if it is really specifically ordered, but they go and place them as randomly as possible and in the end what you end up seeing is a really dense homogeneous type of packing. Okay, that, this was what uh, we figured out from our work. So you, you have a combination of large particles or large size bricks and small size bricks that are continuously being placed and in the end what you have is a completely homogeneous, a completely uh, system that is well sealed and the termite mound is uh, repaired. So this was at the micro level. So we need to look at two scales, right? One is what's happening at the micro level. What, what does the packing look at the micro level? But let's look at what's happening at the macro level. So if you take a termite mound and then you take sections, you cut it, cut the termite mound and observe from the top, you put a camera and observe from the top, you see that you have a central core and then sort of finger-like projections that move away from the core. Okay, so this is a central core and then you have all these buttresses or finger-like projections that move away from the core. Okay, so this type of a structure, this uh, structure with a central core but, but uh, with buttresses that are uh, moving away from the core adds to the stability of the structure and also helps in increasing the porosity of the structure. So as I was telling you, they need to live there, they need to grow their fungi for which they need to maintain high humidity as well as high temperature. So in order to achieve all these uh, you know, parameters, what you can think of is a situation where you have you've built a structure that has multiple such finger-like projections and this contributes to the overall stability and it's a trade-off between stability and ventilation. 
Okay. So uh, again, I'm not going to get into this, but this is a, a typical engineering uh, exercise that anyone would do. If let's say you want to understand how stable are slopes, you walk from here to uh, say to IISE, you see this Chaudaya road uh, on Sankey tank on either side. So you see that there's a slope right on either side. So the road is built high and it's resting on a slope. So how stable are these slopes? There's a very classical engineering way of understanding how stable are these slopes. So you can think about the termite mound also as a slope. right? And you can ask the same question, how stable is it? Why is it so stable? And then we come up with an answer that this combination of dense, uh, dense core and sort of a loose periphery contributes to this enhanced stability. And uh, it also contributes to uh, you know, better heat and mass transfer inside the mound and things like that. So uh, that's kind of what we did. So we took samples at different locations from the core as well as from the buttress. And we said that the core is much denser. When the core is much denser, the core of the termite mound is much denser, it adds to the stability and it also adds to the, uh, the issue of ventilation here. And uh, lastly, there's a there's a, this very interesting trade-off between uh, strength and weathering resistance. Uh, again, it might be a little bit too much here, but the idea that they use the available water and bring together these soil particles and they allow cycles of wetting and drying to take place in the mound just because of the natural environment, it creates or it enhances the strength of the structure significantly. So this whole idea of using suction, um, uh, again, I'm not sure if I should get too much into it because it might seem a little, you might just lose me here. But the idea that you have a combination of air and water, exactly like, uh, you can think about it like a brick. The way how a brick's formed, you take soil, mix it with water, you cast it in different shapes, you know, like a brick, uh, a cuboid, and then you heat it or you allow it to, I mean, you allow a certain amount of temperature on, the, on that uh, thing, you air dry it first, and then you allow it to sit in an oven, and then you do something to it so that this particular chemical reaction, it allows this significant amount of suction force to build up, and you end up with a very strong structure. And so you can, do, you can think about it the same way. The termites bring together using their own secretion as well as using the water, they bring together these boluses, these bricks, and then they s make this beautiful mound. And over cycles of heating and drying because of the, the weather itself, you have a structure that is significantly stronger. So this, this whole idea of suction coming into play. In terms of termite mounds, the, they are, of course, shelter, they are protection from predators, and they have thermoregulation, and they are an incubator for fungal gardens. And they work as a compressive structure. That's something that I, I already mentioned. And it's a combination of both exogenous and endogenous materials. That is, materials from outside, which is the soil, and their own secretion, which is, uh, which is what they use. And of course, the trade-offs are uh, construction versus strength and ventilation. And most importantly, these are bilayered structures with very high strength and stability and optimum ventilation and moisture retention. So this is something about uh, termite mounts. And social spider webs are, of course, completely endogenous. And the evolution of the spider web, it's a function of both group size and time. And the per capita investment remains, that is, how much silk does one single spider invest, remains pretty much unchanged. And the other important thing is, at every stage, these nests are still serving the organisms using it. And uh, last thing about bird nests, are, uh, I'm, again, I didn't mention the very specialized nests like swifts and weaver nests and all that. Those are not something that I talk about here. But I'll talk about, I spoke about only those bird nests that are elytry structures that are, that are obtained from just sort of throwing these uh, flexible uh, chains type of systems. And what you end up having is a completely entangled structure that is made out of flexible rods. You can think about them as made out of flexible rods. And this emergent property, the stability of the bird nest comes from the individual entities sort of piled together in one uh, system. Okay. 
So the questions for all of us to think about is, how do I compare the energies that each of these organisms spend? So which one is the most efficient? Include yourself also in it, human beings also. So ask the question, what is the, which one of us is the most efficient in terms of the overall energy spent? And if, let's say, they, are there specific strategies that emerge for social construction versus birds that pretty much build alone? I, I think they, they also build together, but I'm not very sure. As I said, I'm not an ecologist. The most important thing is that, uh, that we should think about is making sure that the structures are serviceable and usable at all stages of construction. What does that mean? So in terms of human construction, you wait till the entire house is built and then occupy the house. Right? I mean, that's the idea. You build the house, you wait for it to be built completely. And the same thing with a bridge or any other thing. You, uh, it's getting built, you don't start using it as it's getting built. Right? That's kind of not the case when it comes to uh, spider webs or termite mounds or sometimes even bird nests. Right? They need to live there, they need to eat there, they need to, I don't know, attract mates there. All these things have to happen while they are being constructed. So there is this very interesting uh, optimization that has to happen at every stage of the construction. That is, it needs to be serviceable and it needs to be usable at every stage, unlike human construction. So that's sort of an interesting thing that we can all ponder. So that's uh, pretty much the end of my talk. And I want to acknowledge uh, a few of my colleagues and collaborators here. Uh, and uh, the work with termite, the work on termite mounts was done by, done in collaboration with my colleague Rene Borges. Apparently, people in Bab Planetarium know her very well because of uh, her interaction and her, uh, you know, her time here that she has given to give lectures and stuff like that. That's what I've been told. And of course, uh, my uh, friends and colleagues Hema and Divya, who are at, uh, who are the spider people, and Suhel, who helped me with uh, some of the bird nest. Uh, research and Debraj, who is my colleague in IIC, who is also interested in uh, spider webs and vibrations in spider webs. And uh, these two people were my former students who worked on some of the problems. And these are my current students who are working on some of these problems. And of course, Government of India for funds. Thank you. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. I felt that the glass beads were too large for the termites. Oh, we gave them a range of sizes. Okay. <laughs> we gave them a range of sizes. I uh, forgot to put in this uh, electron microscopy, uh, electron microscope uh, photograph of how two beads are sort of cohered with their secretion. You can easily see that the two beads are sort of brought together in the presence of some small amount of their secretion. Okay. Yeah, we gave them a range of sizes. All the materials which you gave the example, the copper and yes, everything? Yes, yes. I mean, it's sort of inbuilt into them. They yeah. always go. The moment they are... The experiment was very similar. So you take a dish, you put the material on the, on the dish and allow some termites to sit on them. So they just collect whatever is available and they use their secretion and try to make bricks. Some of them are easy to make, some of them are very difficult to make. So obviously if you give them like some sort of a gel, jelly type of thing, they have to dig it up, okay. try to make balls out of it and then try to sort of bring them together and that's very very so hard. they were not picky about the material that I won't use this and I won't mm. use that? Uh, they yeah. were able to uh, adopt the material? That's right. They, they just take all the material that, is, that, that was provided to them. But again, they have a preference. So if you actually do a preference, they pick soils that are... Uh, I think that was what I was trying to show in one of the figures the, yeah, there. The yeah. No, the previous one, I think. The, the uh, it was the graph. Somewhere. Circular she, graph. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This one. Yeah, that one. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a certain preference, of course. The idea is they, they will pick granular systems that are hydrophilic. I mean, you know, and soils really fit this uh, very well. This table of uh, choices very well. One more question. Uh, when you did a breach on the uh, termite mound, and it got patched up in 16 minutes. How did you identify the boluses being of major workers or minor oh, workers? I Just have, imagine, I I, but because uh, <coughs> it, the the patch was so monochrom, uh, monotonous. I mean, uh, I 
I doubt yeah, if image analysis. Yeah. yeah, image analysis was a little bit hard to do there, but uh, I have like very dedicated students who actually sat down and were able to track the sizes of each of them, looking at it in you know with lot of patience and trying to use a wow. some software to figure out what was the size of the patch that came up, and eventually we came up with this this distribution. Right. Very talented students, yeah. For all the nests or uh, all those things, uh -huh. because human beings are every day developing new design for the building units, uh, Oh, no, 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 we, I believe in superiority of the human intellect, no doubt about that. Yeah, there's, let there not be any question about that, yes. I am definitely smarter than a bird, but uh, uh, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to, uh, perhaps an evolutionary biologist would be able to answer that question much better. I am, I can just only venture a guess that perhaps over time, even their strategies might evolve, right? But I, I don't know, but in the kind of uh, temporal window that, Uh, well, I mean, uh, no, frankly, uh, but my observations have all been restricted to that whatever three-year, four-year period when that PhD student was working on the problem, right? So I have not really done any very long-term experiments that go on for 30, 40 years where I... That's right, yeah. Uh, but again, as I said, maybe an evolutionary biologist will be able to answer this question much, much better. But, you know, in terms of the times that we are looking at, maybe these things cannot be recorded, but maybe over very long periods of time, maybe they do change their strategies or whatever. But I can only say that if it is behavioral strategies, I don't know how long it takes to change. I, again, I'm not a biologist. I don't know anything about this. But if it's physiologically uh, sort of stitched into them, I, again, I can only venture a guess. Maybe when, when the migratory birds, then they need to adapt for the climatic conditions. And, uh, if, if they use the, they may not get the same kind of, uh, I mean, twigs or whatever the materials, what they are available in one place. Is it so that they will have the same kind of nests all over whenever they go to the different places or? is what I want to do. Because it may not be over a period of 30 to 40 years. Great but question. But again, I, you know, you might want to talk to a person who yeah. studies birds as such. I, I, at least in the, in the amount of studying that I have done on bird nests, I haven't come across any experiments where people actually tracked migratory birds. But I'm sure they have tracked them for behavior. But they, I don't know whether they actually go and nest differently in different locations. Perhaps they do because the materials available are different. But uh, the point that I was trying to make through this thing was the strategy for construction yeah. is, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's in like an emergent property. It's like a taking a bunch of rods, putting them together and creating a, a, a nest that is stable. No, it's a great work, uh, no doubt. I have a last question. Yeah. What is the work of that soldier? I mean, you know, major and minor you mentioned. But there was one more uh, thing that was there in there, uh, in terms of termite, which is mentioned as soldier there. Um, I have no idea. I, right, I know. I mean, we were able to identify them, but I'm not sure if they participate actually in nest okay. construction, or we were not able to identify, or, or maybe they may look said, after. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at least the construction uh, aspect and the granular mechanics aspect that we looked at, the biodispersity comes from the major workers as well as the minor workers. So the bigger bolus is from the major workers and the smaller bolus is from the minor workers. So this biodispersed mixture of grains is what allows this very dense and uh, uh, a nice packing to emerge. Is this age related? The major the minor no, they are physiologically different. Uh, these, the honeybees, uh, in the building of the, they have stages like when the, uh, they are hatched, the next day, the ones that are hatched, they look after the babies 
you know they have stages so is it like that or uh, I, I will find out and tell you i mean i am uh, oh. from what i understand these are uh, these are different uh, okay. casts of the termites itself so they are born major and i oh. think so i'm again uh, probably rene would have been able to answer this much better yeah so, uh, more of the engineering was what i looked at yeah. have you tried to build uh, a larger structure simulating uh, the termite mound right because uh, i saw you tried something with the twigs or at least the photograph indicated that you tried a human scale or a slightly larger structure so have have you or anybody tried to build a termite mound equivalent cave or something for a human dwelling um yeah. would that actually uh, yeah 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 so this well. this kind of work has been done by a few architects i mean you know people think use this as an inspiration and uh, try to again like i was trying to mention it's a trade off between strength and ventilation right, right. so the idea is you use uh, sort of available structures and make them as porous as possible or use this whole idea of a porous structure and allow you know sort of internal climate control to emerge from this using the uh, porosity of the structure so uh, i'm not going to say categorically that no you have not of course people have used this as an inspiration and architects have designed buildings and whatever else but if your question is have i actually built a termite mound from scratch no no no, no. i i meant to say like see uh, i mean use this as an inspiration and built another engineering built, structure and tried to yeah which yeah, is so, so similar to uh, what <laughs> where a human could live right yeah like i said yes so those sorts of things are definitely used and right and even in the case of uh, i was showing you a picture of uh, um birdness yeah the, um, that one. there was a there was a photograph that i was trying yeah, to i think after this or before right. this right i think the next one yeah. yeah so this sort of a structure so this kind of a there was a contest or some such thing where uh, architects used these uh, very interesting shapes of particles of grains and then sort of threw them together and built such structures where you could possibly live uh, i mean again it wasn't i'm not sure if somebody lived in it but these were sort of done at a much larger scale much larger land scale than a bird nest so these were so uh, i didn't sh uh, i had a picture where a, a, a woman was standing underneath okay. that so uh, hmm. in in real life what is a hybrid of something like this with a termite mound give a really good st uh, strength to the structure which could then be used for some kind of a low cost versus yeah uh, i mean uh, you know you must have heard of these things called adobe constructions and stuff like that so they use a combination of soil as well as straw mm -hmm. hay these yeah. sorts of things to create these uh, dwellings so um, uh, again i i can't really say if it has been studied in detail i'm sure any everything has been studied in detail but uh, uh, i'm uh, you know i'm i'm but the but the concept is not too far away okay so you and it's very common even in like today's construction to use materials such as polymers and stuff right. like that in the presence of soils to make structures that are very strong so if you go and travel uh, in any hilly areas you see that the hills are the the slopes are stabilized with these sorts of uh, polymeric textiles that that kind of are used to fold in the soils and they keep them stable over very long periods of time I think so even the a, root system would actually keep yeah the, even roots also yeah so, so those are uh, i mean again combinations of these uh, uh, combinations of the two yeah. Yeah. one uh, interesting observation we both did yesterday one of our pots uh, the, uh, it fell down and broke and inside we actually found like a structure of caves built by ants which uh, i was surprised that it wouldn't possibly even submerge so it's like a waterproof it wasn't termites yeah but those are normal uh, ant ants seem to have tunnels, built a yeah. nest inside even earthworms so lots of such uh, lots of such organisms that build very fascinating such structures so there is a, um, about 5 uh, 6 years ago they did uh, a, like a very clever experiment where they had uh, in between two transparent sheets of glass they filled it up with glass beads and they allowed a bunch of ants to 
flow through them. And uh, you could see, because they they had it between two sheets of glass, you could see how these ants form these very intricate tunneling tunnels. And these remain stable. Because, I mean, if you start digging into earth, they will immediately keep collapsing, right? The earth yeah. keeps collapsing around your, you know, around the dug hole. Very, yeah. it's not so easy to keep something stable over long periods Correct. of time. So the, uh, so people are asking this question as to why are these ant tunnels so stable? So specific. is it just the geometry that helps in the stability or are there some specific structural signatures that one could study as to how are these grains arranged around this table, uh, around the tunnel that keeps them stable? So these are questions that uh, engineers are asking. So they are water, even the uh, termite mounds, they are waterproof also? Or Absolutely. They are pretty much watertight. I mean, you, uh, I was told once, I think, uh, by my colleague that uh, there was like a flooding and then the recession of, the, I mean, the receding of the water, but the termite mound remained no problem. It just remained as it is. Yeah, they are very stable. Yes, thank you. Sir, while you were uh, showing us about those twigs and the compressibility, huh? so uh, did you ever come across beaver dams? Because I think they use the same uh, method. Yeah, uh, but I stuck with three organisms that are actually found in India. Okay. Huh. <coughs> right, beaver dams are again one, one but, other fascinating. So they use the same uh, yeah. idea, right? They, they use the very same idea, yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure you find beaver dams in India. No. Not yet. no. Yeah. So one question about the migratory birds. Uh, again, he actually spotted a hawk's nest, which actually had a lot of rags, plastic, all kinds of things. Which, uh, so uh, that means they actually pick whatever they find. Yeah. Um, so um, the work that I'm showing you. Uh, Hunter King and uh, this this piece of work, uh, this particular piece of work, uh, he was trying to do experiments inside a inside a like a sort of a a zoo, yeah. and uh, where he was providing these birds specific type of materials the, with very well known uh, aspect ratios, and trying to see if the bird nests that emerge have very varied properties. And he writes in the paper that he was not very successful in trying to make them build whatever he wants them to build. I mean, though, that's the problem with these things that are enmeshing both engineering as well as animal behavior, right? So animals do what they want to do. They don't necessarily follow your lab protocol and yeah, yeah. You want something done, but they don't do it. Uh, sir, there is a, a question from an online uh, participant. He, says, he asks, how long on an average does termites take to build a mound? Uh, actually, I have no idea about that particular thing. The, the termite mounds that we have looked at are all existing mounds. So uh, the question, I guess, is how long does it take for the mound to come ground up? Yes. I don't know if there are real observations about it. Because they, and I can tell you that they are very fast. If you make breaches and if you sort of break even large chunks of it, if it's a working mound, if it's, that is, uh, if the termites are residing in them, they really patch up very, very quickly. So I can only sort of vaguely answer that question, but I don't know a definite timeline. So thank you very much for a wonderful talk. <laughs> and... Uh, Perhaps one statement which really blew my, my mind away today uh, was when he said that uh, whether it's a nest or a web or a mound, it's a work in progress. At all times, it, the construction is going on, and yet it is complete in its own sense. So the organism or the society, the colony, is able to survive, carry out all its activities, and the construction continues, whereas in our case, that's not, the, uh, that's not what happens. So we wait until 
the house is completed and sometimes uh, for the right muhurta to get into the house. So <laughs> these organisms, they are already there right from day one and they are constructing and they are using it. Uh, that is something really mind-blowing, uh, uh, how there is uh, completeness in the work that is continuously going on. That really bl blew my mind away. So thank you very much for a wonderful talk. And it's so nice to see that um, a civil engineer works on a biological system. As they often say, uh, when a person from a different discipline works uh, in a, an entirely new discipline, a new way of working out the problems come into the picture. So as a civil engineer, the kind of uh, solutions and the methodologies that he brings in to understand these mounds, a trained biologist would never be able to do that. So it's, uh, it underlines a very important idea that uh, especially students are here, we have to say this, uh, this compartmentalization of physics, chemistry, biology or engineering and pure science uh, is a melting pot now. So you, you have to be good at everything. So keep your eyes and mind open to all s such things. Who knows, you may come up with a very interesting problem and you would be able to solve with the training of mind of a physicist or a cosmologist and it can be anybody. So uh, that's the takeaway. So thank you very much once again. And as a token of uh, our appreciation, as a token of our appreciation, I request our director, Sri Pramod Galgali, to hand over a memento to you. It's an exogenous memento. <laughs>